In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not fully lived as your kingdom people. We have not brought forth the fruits of righteousness as we ought. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways and bear kingdom fruit to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. Gracious God, you gave your Son into the hands of sinful men who killed him. Forgive us when we reject your unfailing love and grant us the fullness of your salvation. We ask all of this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our scripture reading. Our first scripture reading for this weekend is from the Old Testament, and it's from the prophet Isaiah, the 25th chapter. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of food, rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. 
Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise now for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, How did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now, having heard God's word, we have the opportunity to confess our Christian faith, and we're going to do that using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
special thanks to Ashley and Laura. Thank you very much for uh, leading us in the musical part of the service today. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So again, uh, this is a special weekend, and we recognize the ways that God has worked through the LWML. And uh, again, what is the whole purpose of it is, is taking Christ out into the world and supporting uh, uh, women who are a part of that ministry. And uh, there's something that we're going to say in the uh, LWML pledge, which all Christians can say together after the sermon. And, um, and it talks, there's a part in there that, uh, that we could help out those who don't understand the word. And, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to use the epistle lesson uh, from Philippians. We're going to fo- use it all, but we're going to focus on verses 4 and 13. So Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And then 13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The grace to all of you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, last night I had two pastors uh, sitting there in the, in the congregation, but uh, I see lay people here today. So, so it, it's a little bit more of a fair game. What would you say, if you had to guess, is the most misunderstood or misused Bible verse uh, in all of Scripture? You know, there are quite a few that have been regularly taken out of context and misused in various ways. I would have to say that Philippians 4.13 is, in our day and age, a front runner for that top position. Because I've heard this used so many times by people, a lot of times in the public forum, as some kind of a battle cry or a self-help motivator for why they can do uh, various earthly things and how Jesus is going to make that happen for them just as they plan it out and envision instead of the greater meaning that is actually intended here in the text. I'm going to try something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to use a a fake article, as it were, from the Christian uh, satire website, the Babylon Bee. They did a wonderful illustration of this text and, uh, and how it is misused uh, a few years back. It was after the uh, basketball team, the Golden State Warriors. They became the first team in NBA history to lose a three games to one lead in the NBA Finals. Now, the Warriors, if you don't know much about them, are led by a wonderful Christian man named Stephon Curry, who is he's a good guy and he is very vocal about his Christian faith. But this was their humorous but pointed take on this text. So the headline of the article said this, Devastated Stephon Curry Discovers Context of Philippians 4.13. So let's go through this edited version. Thoroughly baffled after losing Game 7 to the Cleveland Cavaliers Sunday night, despite his frequent assertion that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him, which he assumed would include winning as many NBA titles as he desired, Stephon Curry reportedly pulled his Bible out of his locker and hastily flipped to Philippians 4.13 to make sure he had been reading his life verse correctly all these years, only to discover, much to his devastation, multiple additional verses before and after the text. Wait, what are all these other words? I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content, he slowly read aloud, seriously, in whatever situation, a shocked Curry reportedly then sat on the locker room floor in disbelief. It doesn't mean that I can do anything at all because of Jesus? At publishing time, sources confirmed that a wave of relief had washed over Curry as he realized that While it would be nice for Philippians 4.13 to be an ironclad promise that any believer can literally do anything because of Jesus, the meaning he now understands it to have because of the context is that Jesus is enough for any believer to be content in any situation he or she faces is even better, especially after the most disastrous finals collapse in NBA history. Now, I think that that is a wonderful way, apparently more wonderful than you guys do, but uh, 
At any rate, I think they get right to the heart of the matter and how the common culture today in the 21st century misuses this text. But this is what Paul is getting at here in Philippians. See, because of the eternity-changing work of Jesus Christ, and because your relationship with heaven has been brought back to life from the dead, you are now living in a new way. Because you have had the impossible done to you and for you through the cross of Christ, you can now live in an impossible way right here and right now. But let's get this straight. Let's not take this out of context like so many people do. We need to remember two key points about this text as we use it as the weapon God wants us to use it as. Number one, the power to make the impossible happen does not come from us. It comes from Jesus Christ. And number two, doing the impossible here in this world doesn't always look like we think it will or write it out which is how this verse gets so misused. But the truth is, and the great news for you and me, is that God has a way bigger impossible. I know that's probably poor grammar. Don't care because it's applicable here. He has a way bigger impossible in store for us when we let him do his work in us. And so here's how this equation works. Your sins have been forgiven. That's impossible for you to accomplish. Death does not get the final word in the story of your life. That's impossible for you to accomplish. Your enemy, the devil, has been tried and sentenced to eternal prison. That's impossible for you to accomplish. The world has been broken and ruined by the effects of sin, and yet through Christ, you are called to live in what? The peace that passes all understanding. That reality is impossible for you to accomplish. But like Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 18, what's impossible for man is possible with God. He's in the business of making the impossible happen for you and me. And that's the power that Paul is referring to here and everywhere else he writes. See, the power and the work of Jesus Christ is so effective at securing eternal life for us. It reaches into this world gives you and me a new power to live by. And you know what? At times he does the miraculous in us in such a way that it looks like a great ending to a Hollywood movie. Give you a couple of examples. Who would ever think that a group of scraggly, uneducated, not world beaters could start a community called the church that changes time and history forever? Who would ever think that a mess up like Peter could walk on water, even if for just a few seconds? Who would ever think that the disciples that abandoned Jesus at his crucifixion just a few months earlier would then later be used to heal the sick and cure people of their diseases and take his message to the world? You know, you can look at those situations, you could see the miraculous in them. But even there, let's get to the truth. It's the common thread running through all of those impossible and miraculous events. Those people were not doing all things through their own power. It was through the one who strengthens them. Again, sometimes we get to take part in things that seem otherworldly. But I think if we're always looking for that stuff, we are totally missing the boat. Because the longer I live, the more I realize and appreciate what God is telling us in his word and how what he is offering us is even greater than what you and I call miraculous. So let's go back to that opening illustration. What if Steph Curry had tapped into his inner impossible, and with the help of his you know, genie buddy Jesus, this is what we like to do with him a lot of time, right? All right, Jesus, you just go over there on the shelf, and uh, when I need you for something special, I'll bring that down, and I'll, I'll give you a pat, and, and I'll ask you for something, then we'll just put you right back up. But let's just say that he had won the NBA Finals that year, and uh, it all worked out the way that he wanted. Well, it's pretty cool, I guess, right? But that pales in comparison to living with a power that you can use daily to overcome the fear that comes with living in a broken world. I mean, how much more valuable is it to have daily peace in this life than to win a few basketball games? 
How much more valuable is it to live boldly in all circumstances, knowing that God is offering you the gift of daily contentment if you will only take it from him? How much more valuable is the knowledge that when you leave this life, you go to a new life that is so perfect and so massive that words and images in this world can't properly describe how amazing it is. That's what's being offered to you and me. I love this quote from a pastor when he said this about this text. He said this, and let's put this up on the wall. I'm not trying to say that if a person believes in Jesus Christ, he will no longer encounter difficult situations, trials, and tribulations in life. But I am saying with Paul that if a person surrenders himself completely to Christ, places him first in his life and is guided in all things by his word, he will find power and strength to overcome obstacles. Now watch what he defines as obstacles. He will be victorious over the very things which defeat and destroy the average man. The events of the world have combined to depress bewilder, and terrorize the people of the world, but not the Christian. He can do that which is impossible for the natural man. He can shackle his fear and live in confidence, assurance, and peace because his trust is placed in the one who rules and controls. That, my friends, is a way bigger and more important possible than the other stuff of life that we just kind of want to trot out every now and again. And that's what God wants us to understand about this verse and about his gifts and what he wants us to live in. See, let's not just uh, narrow this down and focus on using this power every once in a while for a project at work or for a sports game. And yes, it absolutely applies to those things, but only because the truly impossible obstacle of eternal life has been made different for us now And now we can attack the individual events and challenges of everyday life through the power of God. Is that not a greater gift? I mean, come on, forget the pandemic of the coronavirus. The pandemic of anxiety, worry, and fear of daily living in a broken world is a far greater threat to this world and has been ever since the fall into sin. Wouldn't a cure for that be absolutely amazing? Well, that's exactly what God is offering you and me through his son. You can have an impossible peace that doesn't come from anything else. You can have an impossible contentment that does not come from this world. You can have a power to handle challenges in a completely new and different way. And you know what we're called to do? Because this is our reality, which I think we sometimes forget as Christians. Let's put the word up on the wall. Rejoice. Rejoice always. Again, I'll say it, rejoice in the Lord. Isn't that how we are to live as the people of God who have been given this gift? And and let's be very clear about this. The power to do all things, including tackling the problems of everyday life in a sinful world, can only come from one person, Jesus Christ. You know, isn't it interesting to watch St. Paul tell the story of salvation as he includes himself into the story. When he refers to himself in the story of salvation as we see it, how does he talk about himself? One place he says, well, I'm a wretch. Another place, I'm the chief of sinners. Another place, I can't stop committing the sins I don't want to commit. He says in another place, I am the worst of the worst. So how does that guy then turn around and then say like he does in our text, I can do all things. See, he can do all things when he has given up trying to do the impossible through his own power. He can do all things when he has surrendered to Christ and given everything over to him. He can do all things when he is living in the power and the work that Jesus Christ has secured for him. And that's the call for us today. See, this isn't a verse meant to pump us up when we need to accomplish something It's a declaration of our reality that becomes ours when we give ourselves over to God. As long as we're relying on our own wisdom and our own power to tackle the impossible, we will always fail. If we're counting on our own power for victory over the things of the world, we will always be losers. But when we are connected to the manger and the cross and the empty tomb, we're connected to the one who has defeated all of the problems of the world. 
And the way we get connected to this power is to give up trying to do the impossible and let Jesus Christ do it for us, to us, and through us, because only he can do that. And so that's my prayer for each and every one of us, that we would actually harness this power that has been given to us by God, do it in a right way, do it in a daily way, and in a way that changes everything about who we are and everything about the world we come in contact with. You know, it hasn't been a great uh, couple of weeks for people who happen to be my personal heroes. I mentioned uh, two weeks ago, uh, one of my baseball heroes, Lou Brock, passed away. And uh, in the past few days, the world has lost two uh, very uh, important people who were very good at what they did. On October 2nd, uh, pitcher Bob Gibson, uh, my favorite baseball player of all time, uh, just a side note, passed away, played for God's team. And uh, he was such a dominating pitcher that he was one of the reasons that Major League Baseball lowered the pitching mound because he was so good at what he did. He literally altered the field of play because he was so good at what he did. October 6th, this past week, uh, one of my personal musical heroes, guitarist Eddie Van Halen, passed away. Eddie was so good at playing the guitar that his band created a new genre of music. He changed how people play guitars now, and he was so gifted at understanding and developing the mechanics of guitars, he actually changed how guitars are made and manufactured. What is common today on a guitar that you go buy in a store was not common before he came onto the scene. Bob and Eddie, two people who have excelled in their fields and their lifetime body of work, influence big changes in their particular areas of expertise. They were game changers. We lose great humans all the time, don't we? People who were great in their fields, great at what they did, but no matter how important the accomplishments they or any other humans have accomplished, those accomplishments aren't so great that they could offer up a power to the whole world to live in that allows you and me to go and steal from our enemies. We are called to do that very thing, folks. We are called by God Almighty to rob fear, rob worry, despair, rob the enemy of the power of death, rob the enemy of the power of the devil, and live in a new way. That's the message for you and me today. You want to live in the power to handle all things. Give yourself over to the one who makes that your reality. His name is Jesus Christ, and through him, you can do all truly important, eternal, life-changing things. God bless us to live in that power today and every day. Amen. Would you please rise? And now may the peace which passes all of our human understanding. Guard our hearts and minds and keep us in the one true faith until we come to life eternal. Amen. We're going to go to our Lord in prayer, but before we do that, I invite you uh, to take part in what we call the LWML Pledge, and, uh, and uh, that will be projected there uh, up on the wall. And then uh, after that, we will uh, bless, uh, you'll see a, a display in the back, and uh, what we're doing at each of these services, we're blessing uh, the work of the LWML and the, the uh, uh, quilts and, uh, and medical kits and, and uh, uh, various things that they send out to people around the world that God would bless them for use in his kingdom. So let's recite the pledge together. In fervent gratitude for the Savior's dying love and his blood-bought gift of redemption, we dedicate ourselves to him with all that we are and have, and in obedience to his call for workers in the harvest fields. We pledge him our willing service wherever and whenever he has need of us. We consecrate to our Savior our hands to work for him, our feet to go on his errands, our voice to sing his praises, our lips to proclaim his redeeming love, 
our silver and our gold to extend his kingdom, our will to do his will, and every power of our life to the great task of bringing the lost and the erring into eternal fellowship with him. Amen. Now let's go to our Lord as we ask him to bless the quilts and the kits. Lord God Almighty, you have used your people in old times and in modern times for your glory and for the good of your kingdom. We ask that you would please continue to bless the work of the LWML and all that they do around the world and in the United States and North America and locally. Lord, we ask that you would bless uh, our particular chapter here at Trinity, and we ask for your blessing upon their work, that it would bear fruit for your kingdom and it would heal uh, any suffering that goes on with our neighbors wherever you see fit to take those things. Lord, continue to guide, direct, and bless them. And we ask all this in the name of Christ, who makes that all possible. Amen. Now for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us go to our Lord in prayer. We ask for peace throughout the world and for the well-being of the church of God and, and for the unity of all. We ask for the Lord's blessing upon this house and for all who worship here. Lord, we ask that you continue to bless the mission of the LWML and that uh, you would assist each woman uh, in the LCMS in affirming her relationship with you, the triune God, so that she is enabled to use her gifts in ministry to the people of the world and to support global missions through the gathering of mites and providing of mission grants. Lord, we pray for all your kingdom, that uh, your, all your kingdom people may produce kingdom fruit to your glory and for the expansion of your kingdom on earth. Be with those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection here and in every place. Lord, we ask that you'd please bless the world with favorable weather and continue to be with those who are suffering from the effects of the fires and the uh, dangerous weather in the south. Lord, we pray for an abundance of the fruits of the earth and for peaceful times. Help us, Lord, in our times of affliction, wrath, and danger, and need. We ask that you'd hear all those requests we lift up to you in a private way, and also ask that uh, you would be with uh, Deb and Rhonda and all those who are suffering from poor health at this time. Continue to bless and guide them. We ask that you'd be with Pastor Holmes and his family as they start this new chapter of life and continue to guide and direct them according to your good and gracious will. We thank and praise you for the gift of marriage and all the blessings you give us, and we celebrate this weekend with Wayne and Donna Harshaw and 63 years of marriage that you have blessed them, blessed them with. Continue to guide and direct them according to your will and bless all the marriages of your communities that are centered on you, that they would be the place of love, forgiveness, and peace that you want them to be. Now into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your goodness and remembering with thankfulness your mercies, which are new every morning. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.